Welcome to e-commerce marketing with the Pitbulls, where we catch up with craft brands to hear their story and learn how they're growing their e-commerce channel. Hi, I'm Andy. And I'm Lindsay. And today we are joined by Lex Evan. Um, Lex is the founder, CEO, and chef at Lexington Bake Bakes, I should say, um, a uh, uh, organic, clean, ethical ingredients, uh, just gourmet, luxury, beautiful uh, individual cookie. Lex is the designer, brand strategist, writer, uh, chef, everything uh, to go along with this, um, and something we want to talk a little bit more about. Um, that I think a lot of our audience is going to really connect with. Lex, thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. Um, did I miss anything in the intro here? Is there anything else to uh, give us a little bit of background here about uh, about the brand and and kind of what you're up to these days? Sure. Um, so I've spent 15 years in CPG on the beauty side. I've worked with um, Neutrogena, Vino, Clean and Clear, basically every retailer on the private label side before I worked at J&J. Um, in the last two years, I have been building Lexington Bakes as a brand, but in the last 10 years, I've been teaching myself how to bake. Um, so Lexington Bakes started as a as an accident, or uh, I should say a miscommunication on my personal Instagram account. I had tried my hand at several other startups over the last 10 years, finally came to the conclusion that it was just not my thing and got back into baking. And literally the first post on Instagram, everyone started DMing me for orders just because I had labels. I'm a designer, I, I'm extra at everything. I had no intention of selling these brownies. They're very expensive ingredients that I make for myself. I didn't think they'd resonate with everyone else, but to my surprise, they did. And in five short days, I had $5,000 in my Venmo to start this business. That's awesome. I feel like that's the uh, a lot of we work with a lot of kind of smaller brands and and I think you know really the audience of of this podcast probably um, a lot of people who are you know kind of chasing the dream of you know a product that they're passionate about and and you know trying to make it work so that's really really cool that you kind of you kind of did it you know just out there uh, making the push. I leaned into the demand because that past startups. Have just been push, 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 and I'm I'm so tired of pushing products. So, if people want me to make these, I will make them for as long as they th- they want me to make them. <laughs> Tell me a little bit more about um, making this jump from you know kind of working. You, you mentioned you were working at J and J, and uh, and kind of building this brand on the side um, to ultimately you know how did you decide that you're ready to to make the jump and, and it was time to go full time? Sure. So I've been building this for two years, every night, every weekend, I've had no social life. Um, But it's been fun because I love dessert and I love creating new recipes. um, And I love that people love what I make. I, I kept kicking the milestone. I don't know if that's the right expression, but for the last two years, I kept saying like, oh, this is what I need to reach to quit my job. And the brand has lived on its own from day one. And as much as I am leading it, I'm more um, guiding it and kind of listening more than leading. So the launch on Instagram before there was even a brand or a product or packaging or anything that within six weeks, I went from idea to commercial kitchen to producing brownies in bulk, shipping them across the country. In the next month, I launched online with Shopify. Three months after that, retail was knocking at my door. And it's like, we want to put you in 20 stores. So the milestone kept changing. And after two years, it, it's finally settled in a place where I have a clear path on how this is going to grow. It's no longer this ambigu- ambiguous kind of well, is it going to grow as a DTC brand? Is it going to grow as a retail brand? I'm, I guess I'm no longer bootstrapped because I, I raised a 100k uh, small business loan, but for a big chunk of that two years, it was bootstrapped. So realistically, what can I do on my own to scale this to a point where I can pay myself, or at least a path to paying myself? <laughs> um, long story short, 
it's been two years. It I'm now in 50 stores. They sell out weekly. I am I can't produce enough product to meet the demand. That's given me a lot of confidence, but it's also the confidence of repeat purchase that makes me believe that there's something here in the long, long run. Um, I've also, I've been at J&J for the last 10 years consistently, and I've worked on so many brands and I'm still so passionate about brand strategy and design. So it was really hard for me to, to give that up. Like I've spent 15 years of my life building this career. It's hard to walk away from that. Like I tried to do both for two years and I finally reached a point where it's no longer healthy to do both my mental health, my physical health, everything was suffering because I didn't just have two jobs. I also had my health and wellness and nutrition as a, like, that's a whole nother job in my mind. And that's what I sacrificed. So I went from the best shape of my life to somewhat the worst shape of my life. And I'm no longer happy with it. So um, there's a few other moving parts on, on the J&J side too, but I feel like it was a mutual like time to to go and lean into this because I could not grow it more than I have without giving it more of my time. And the only place I could take more time out of was my day job. There, there's no more time in my social life, in my health and wellness life to give up. I've I've given all of that up. So the only other place to take time from was my day job. And that's what made me decide that it's time. It's awesome. What, um, so I know you're, you're kind of, uh, newly onto this journey or the kind of this next step. Um, but how have you been finding it? What, what's your, uh, your early experience in, in full time, Ben? So it's been two full weeks of full time on Lexington Bakes and the trajectory has like skyrocketed. Um, just the mental availability that I have access to, to, to do bigger things or think bigger, um, I should also preface this by saying all the stress has gone away. There, there's no more stress in running any of this. Like sure there's daily hurdles and challenges and like things come at you from every direction, but not managing two jobs, no stress. That's great. Um, I'm launching a new flavor at Erwan in two weeks. And I was planning just like a small dinner party on my rooftop with like 15, maybe 20 friends because I've, given a hundred percent of myself to this brand, this is now turned into a 200 person event with amazing brand partners like Viori and Gorgie and Ophora water. Um, that never would have happened if I still had my job, my other job. I just hearing Erewhon and your brownies are going to be an Erewhon. Did you ever think that was going to happen? What was that process like? And are you kind of pinching yourself? Because that seems really amazing. I just want to give you some claps there. That's Thank incredible. You. <laughs> um, so we launched at Erwan March of this year with our Fleur de Sel brownie and our chocolate chip number five cookie. And I was, I mean, that if if a luxury brownie is going to sell anywhere, it's going to sell at Erwan. So for me, that's also given me the confidence of, all right, like the place where this should work it's working. It has been working since March. Like we've been hovering in the top 12, 10 spots out of like 30 brands in the fridge um, since March. Like that has not gone down. It's, it's only been going up. People are buying this over and over and over again. And that is a phenomenal thing to experience. Like the DMs that I get from people in LA who are just like, we love what you're doing. I'm like, thank you. Cause I'm dying. So hearing that <laughs> lets me keep doing this. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's very rewarding to know that you like what I'm doing. Um, but now that I'm like, okay, it's working. What What's next? I have this new flavor and there's a strategy behind it too, specifically for air one um, to help the brand succeed more, which is, this is our first gluten grain free product that's going to retail. Um, sorry, there are so many tangents in my head that I'm trying to manage right now. <laughs> and I know I'm, I'm, I'm going on <laughs> rambling, but bear with me. Please so do. Our Florida to Cell brownie, chocolate chip number five cookie have been in the number 11, 12 spots out of 60 SKUs in the fridge since March. 
in the top 10, you have gluten-free and vegan products. And my two SKUs that are 11 and 12 are neither of those two, have neither of those two attributes. So in, in my mind, I'm like, okay, these are doing phenomenally well in a place where they shouldn't. Um, what if I bring a gluten-free flavor to this con- customer base, consumer base? What would that do to the, to the brand success? Um, and in my mind, the brand is already super successful. It depends what you're tracking, whether it's units or dollars, or what I think is more important to track is the efficiency of a brand's SKU on shelf. How much real estate are you taking up and how much revenue are you bringing in for that footprint? And when you rank the brands by that, Lexington Bakes is number five out of 60 brands, which is really effing cool. I am sure this is going to bring out a ton more tangents. So I apologize in advance, but I feel like you come from a really interesting perspective of being a designer and someone who's really focused on brand and strategy behind the brand, which I feel like we run into a lot of um, startups who just aren't really focused on that. They're focused on purely like the business side of it and how to get that product. Of course, they have the passion for their product, but they're not coming with a designer's lens. I would really love to get your viewpoint on when you're starting something like this, what are some thoughts that are going in about the design, about brand building? Um, what would kind of advice would you give to someone in the same position you were in? Branding is one of the easiest things you can do when you follow the philosophy of your your job is to communicate a promise and then to deliver on that promise. That is all that branding is. Communicating your promise of what people are going to get and then delivering on that promise. So for me, approaching business or kind of innovation from a design lens, I lead with empathy. I think about how people are going to experience the product um, in every capacity. There's essentially three different ways to launch a product. You're either financially driven, you're R&D driven, or you're design driven. Design is empathy. Um, So it's just like this product is somewhat designed for me, but because I'm because I've spent time re- as a design researcher interviewing people, I'm able to like observe myself from outside of my body as a consumer and extrapolate that information in a way that will apply to a broader consumer base, not just myself. Um, and it's really hard for non-designers to hear from a designer like this is my perspective on why I think it's going to work. This is my experience with it. And they're like, Oh, well, that's, that's just you. That's not a broad sense. I'm like, no, 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 I'm, I'm misspeaking. So this is on me. It's my fault for not communicating this properly. But when I say I do this, or I like something or I'm, it's me analyzing myself. It's not my preference coming forward to say, I want this in the market. I didn't launch luxury brownies because I wanted them in the market. I, I was pulled by a ton of people who wanted these in the market, but it's still like I can extrapolate my flavor profile and read that against trends and what's selling and kind of align my preferences with the preferences of other consumers in the market and kind of like find that middle ground. Um, I think that sounds very confusing. So I'm going to give you one example of where (laughs) it won't work. So People have been asking me for the holidays to do a peppermint brownie. I find peppermint and dessert so not appealing. So Lexington <laughs> Bakes will never launch a peppermint brownie because I don't like it. So how can I possibly develop a recipe that I think is ready for launch when I just I don't know what a good peppermint brownie tastes like because I just I don't like it. There's some limits to that thinking, right? As as I'm listening to you talk, I, I think you know we we you kind of hear both sides oftentimes of you know hey everything is customer focused everything is you know we're going to go out into the marketplace we're going to do a million taste test and whatever our customers tell us we're going to have no ego and we're just going to go with it and you know change the product and and that's what it is um, and then the other side of that is hey you know this is something that I'm so passionate about I built for. A million years and it's you know this is you know my product and i i love it and it's I have, you know that's i know everything about it and this is what i want and you know all else be damned i'm going to put it out in the market because i believe in it and i know it it's going forward um so i think it's it's really interesting to hear you know t- 
to me, you're kind of striking a good balance between those two points um, and kind of bringing in the like, you know, recognizing that, hey, you know, I'm in, in a in a space or in a marketplace where gluten free really, you know, has an opportunity to succeed. But at the same time, you know, now that we've been chatting a little bit, I've heard you say a few times, like Lexington Bakes is never going to do this or never going to do that um, because, you know, like that's just not what you are. And that's, you know, that's not the brand. So that's really, uh, really kind of cool to hear that balance. Yes. So that actually brings up the name of the brand. Um, I was recently I had attended a panel about celebrity, celebrity brands or bringing celebrities into brands. And it works for some brands, but my brand is named after me. And the reason for that is this is my perspective on dessert. And at some point, yes, I will check my ego. This isn't all about me, but I think brands have to have a perspective. You can't just follow what everyone else is doing because then every brand just blends into the same like bland mess of the same things like it's okay that Lexington Bakes will never have a peppermint brownie. Somebody else loves peppermint and chocolate and will make a phenomenal peppermint brownie. I don't have to do that just because they're going to do it. And I don't want to lose share of that one flavor profile. That's okay. Our new flavor at Erwan is a hazelnut jandouille brownie. I don't expect other brands to replicate that. Maybe they'll do something hazelnut. But that is such a specific flavor profile. And it's it's literally because I am obsessed with Jandouille, which if, if people don't know what that is, it's the predecessor to the... Nutella. Yeah. Okay. So Nutella is a brand of Jandouille with maybe not the best ingredients. <laughs> <laughs> I love that confidence to say our brand is not going to do that. And I feel like we run into many brands who are afraid to take a stance in that particular way. Um, Can you talk about your pricing strategy when it comes to promotions and things like that? I think that's such an interesting perspective. So many brands are willing just because everybody else is to have a sale at a certain time. What does Lexington Bakes do? So this might be different because founder-led brands... I think have more room to have that perspective and kind of authoritative, like not authoritative, but just definitive stance on some things. Um, when a founder exits and and other people take over, I think that's where the opportunity opens up for, for brands to lose those principles. For Lexington Bakes, we will never be on sale. We will never have discounts. Our product is so ridiculously epically good. I will never discount that. Like I have poured my heart and soul into these recipes. I develop them all myself. I celebrate every ingredient. I choose ingredients with such care and respect for people on the planet. Like there are so many options when it comes to choosing chocolate. Like how do you decide what is the best chocolate? And it, it's not just about the chocolate. It's about the company you're supporting by buying the chocolate. What are they doing with their profits? Who are they supporting? Are they treating the the planet that they're harvesting from and the people they're harvesting with with kindness and respect? So every ingredient I source goes through that rigorous kind of evaluation of if Lexington Bakes succeed and we in turn buy more ingredients from other companies, what are those companies going to do with those profits? So when you support Lexington Bakes, you're supporting all these other amazing brands that are doing the right thing in the planet, making everything and everyone kind of better. I might have digressed from your question. <laughs> no, I think you answered it perfectly. And okay. I love that. I love too that you pointed out when found, founders leave, it opens up that arena for pulling the brand into so many different directions. So that's just an interesting thought. I have nothing to expand upon it, but I uh, haven't heard it said that way before. So that's probably something a lot of founders think of and think, oh gosh, how do I prevent that from happening if I ever decide to, to exit? Do you have any plans like that for Lexington Bakes or what's kind of like the bigger picture for you moving forward? It's hard. So the scenario in which that happens is right investment. The founder exits because they're no longer capable of growing the brand to what is required to return that investment, someone else has to come in or other decisions have to be made in order to meet those goals. 
this is hard for me because I love what I'm doing. And I would hate to say that I'm building this with an exit strategy because I'm not doing this to get out of it. Like I'm killing myself to get in it because I love what I'm building and making. And because the bigger brands in the world aren't doing this. And what happens is when the, when the found, like if I ultimately leave, let's say in 10 years, who's going to guide the ship on the same path that I'm guiding it on? When something gets to that scale, can you still do what I'm doing? Or when you, let's say hypothetically, it goes public, the the risk is no longer on one person, one founder. The risk is on everyone who owns shares. So the decisions change to protect the shareholders. Like I'm willing to take more risk and say these things and and have such a definitive stance on some things. But once you grow to that size and your goal is to incrementally grow year after year after year, some of those tactics won't work. So that's right. That's the tipping point of like startup to big brand to publicly traded brand or I don't know, privately held, but like tons of investors that want a 10 X return. Like at some point, some things might have to change. I'm going to try my hardest to protect the value of what I'm building for my consumer, which, which means I will never compromise on ingredient standards. I will never change my philosophy on how I source ingredients from which companies. Um, I've had so many companies approach me to switch our ingredients. And my response is, I, I'm building relationships with my ingredient partners. Like they are not just ingredients to me. I love working with them. I love working with the people at those companies. I love supporting their missions. Like it is not just about the sugar. It's about who's harvesting that sugar, who's doing what with the profits from selling that sugar. Like it's just so much more in depth for me, which I think just goes back to the fact that I'm extra in everything that I do. <laughs> That's really cool. I, I think there is kind of a movement going on or, you know, there's, there's a lot of reasons behind it. And, and, you know, certainly I think a lot of people have spoken about the fact that there's a lot more people coming up now both empowered to create their own brands and to, you know, kind of build that, you know, build into a brand like like you're you're saying. But I think also there's more of a take that it doesn't always have to be about building towards the exit anymore. It's okay to say, hey, you know, as an individual, you can build a thriving business that at some point probably tops out and isn't growing like, like you said, like 10x, you know, it's not, we're not like going crazy here, but it can still be very profitable for an individual to run a business like that and, you know, be true to their ideals and to, you know, kind of put that value out into the world. So I think that's, you know, you're, you're speaking to, you know, a trend that I think is, is, you know, what we're going to see a lot more of in the next five, 10, 15 years of people saying like, Hey, I'm not going to compromise with a lot of those things. Um, because I don't need to go public necessarily. I can, you know, build this to a place where I'm personally very successful and I'm living out all those ideals. Um, and you know, just have it be that that kind of business. I, I still think there's room to bring on investors and and hold on to that integrity, but the the strategic decision of when to bring on investment, because I've delayed fundraising, but every month I'm growing the value and I'm proving that my ideas are working and communicating that value to consumers. So I think at some point, if I can scale this on my own to a certain degree, it just gives more confidence in investors in what I'm doing to invest with me without everything I just talked about earlier. Right there, I don't think it's either get investors or don't get investors. It's just about having your direction, sticking to it, staying focused, proving your hypotheses time and time and time again, and earning that trust that what you see is going to happen in the next 10 years can happen. 
because uh, I've learned as a designer working with non-designers for 15 years, not everyone can see in your mind the way you can see. So like I'm a designer because I can see, like even now as we're talking, I have like 10 conversations going on in my mind about like, if I say this, if I divulge this, if I go on this tangent, I'm trying to navigate all of that. And it's the same when I'm designing, um, whether it's designing a postcard or a box or a brand strategy, I have every possible scenario going on in my mind and I can see all the outcomes and I can find a path to my desired end goal. And I'm, I've realized that not everyone can see that. So, which is also great because it explains why you need designers and marketers and scientists and analysts and all these other people to come together. Like there's no way I can build this to hundred million by myself. Like everyone has limits, everyone has strengths and skills. You have to know where your weak spots are and what you can't do and bring on the support and kind of round out that team that way to get there. Definitely. I love that you mentioned that. Can I ask about radical ingredient transparency? Where did that yes. come from? What does it mean? I want to know more. So I have two ingredient lists on my packaging. One is your standard required FDA ingredient list. The second is the more transparent version of that. So I don't think it's enough for brands to say we have organic sugar. I want to know where that organic sugar is coming from. Um, I want to know, is it coming from a brand? Is it coming directly from a farmer? Who are you supporting? So that's, that's another part of it. So it's, it's transparency, traceability, responsibility. It's all kind of all of that embedded in one easy to understand term that I've trademarked. Um, but yeah, I, I get so much feedback from consumers when they see that. And it's just like another moment of delight and surprise. They're like, nobody's doing this. This is amazing. Like, I love knowing exactly what's in this because uh, it makes me feel better about eating it. Like, you can say organic chocolate, but where is it coming from? Is it coming from forced labor and child labor? Or is it coming from a company that stands against those things and makes sure their chocolate is harvested in a fair and sustainable way? So by listing the brands that I'm working with, it makes the treats even better because you you can feel good about indulging. I want like to, that. this feels like another moment that kind of underscores when sometimes we talk to brands and they think like, oh my gosh, how am I going to compete with such bigger brands on the shelf? They're, you know, take up such a huge market share. They're making the prices so low that it's hard to stay profitable and competitive. It's moments like these that I hear where you're doing something so unique and interesting that if a bigger brand was sort of forced to do this and then had to go up against Lexington Bakes, I'm sure a lot of consumers would say, I would rather go to Lexington Bakes. <laughs> so it's moments like that, that I think this is how you make change in such a uh, rigid industry <laughs> like CPG and retail. Do you ever think about that when you're coming up with these terms or is it just kind of... That know, is precisely why I do what I do. Um, coming from the big CPG world, I kind of know all the weak spots and I know how to defend my brand against that. Um, also from watching Shark Tank for like 10 years when someone's just like, <laughs> anyone can do that. Why would I give you the money to do that? And I'm like, well, not everyone can do what I'm doing. Um, finding a way to defend what you're doing and protect it is integral to kind of starting up because I am in only, I'm only in 50 stores. Like if a big CPG brand caught on to what I was doing and saw, I don't know, some future that I'm not seeing and wanted to try and replicate it, I guarantee you their, their target profit margins would not allow them to do what I'm doing. It's a really interesting, especially when you start talking about pricing. Like I think in some ways being a smaller producer, you know, that's a disadvantage that, you know, typically you're going to have to be more expensive than a lot of the, the big, you know, big people. But I think in that way, you kind of find a way to take that, that weakness and turn it into a strength. So that's, that's really cool. So on the topic of price, 
I have put just as much thought into the price as I have everything else. So uh, bear with me. This might be a little bit of a stretch, but to your point of how am I going to compete with all these big brands on shelf? I, as a design strategist, am thinking as a psychologist, how am I going to disrupt your, your patterns, pattern seeking in the grocery store? That I'm doing that in two ways. So the first is the price. When you go to the store and every brand is trying to stick to the same price for the shelf, I'm going to disrupt that. So when everything else is six, seven, eight dollars, my brownie is eleven dollars. And that is the first signal to you when you're scanning and you're like, why the F is this eleven dollars? I need to pick it up and understand. Just I'm I'm tapping into your curiosity. Or your frustration or agitation with like, who has the audacity to put an $11 brownie on the shelf? There's layers to this. So I'm not just saying it's an expensive brownie because I'm saying it's expensive. There are so many ways to justify the price, the ingredients, um, the, the packaging, the design that just communicates the quality of the ingredients. But I'm also not trying to rob you. So when you break down the price per ounce, I am not the most expensive thing on shelf. Everything else on shelf is about two, 2.5 ounces. My brownie is a five ounce brownie. So when something else is 2.5 ounces for $6 and you buy two of those for $12, my brownie at $11 for the same ounce weight is less. So you're, you're getting a, a, it's almost like a bulk discount, but I mean, it's not bulk. It's just um, it's a way for me to disrupt the consumer, like, uh, pattern seeking habits in the grocery store. And there's a sustainability play in that too. So I'm, when I snack two, 2.5 ounces is not enough. So I usually buy two and it just, it drives me insane. The amount of packaging that goes in the garbage because of that. So by making my brownie five ounces, I now have a 50% reduction in packaging, not just in packaging cost, but in packaging waste. So if I were to break my brownie into the standard 2.5 ounces, it would be more than $11 because I would have to pay for that extra packaging. So there, there's thought, this level of thought and detail goes into every tiny little aspect of Lexington Bakes. How do you get to? As we've kind of you know bounced around a couple of different things here, and, and I think you've done a really good job of illustrating in all these different components of the finished product and the packaging and the brand story, um, you know, kind of all the thought and detail that goes into each individual piece. But this is, you know, a 45 minute conversation and we, we've gotten a chance to touch on a lot of those different things as a, like a designer and as you're thinking about you know, things like shelf space and how do we capture attention and how do we, you know, really build a brand in the space of just a few seconds? How do you take all of this thought and all of this, you know, essentially brand story that fits, you know, that all fits together super well if you have 45 minutes to talk about it? Mm -hmm. How do you get that new consumer to, to, you know, take the time to or give you the time to tell your story? Um, so this goes back full circle to branding is simple. You communicate a promise, you deliver on that promise. Um, Lexington makes is very simple. The packaging has no claims. It's just logo, product name, and size. But it's gold. It's a transparent, clear wrapper. You see exactly what you're getting. The gold communicates something different. Um, I don't expect consumers to understand all of these tiny little parts in their first interaction with Lexington Bakes. The brand promise of Lexington Bakes is epic dessert. And when people eat it, they're like, yeah, you, you effing nailed it. That is it. That is the simplicity of Lexington Bakes, right? If I were to put an opaque package, I would have more opportunity for more call outs and claims. And everyone on the shelf is doing that and screaming at the consumer. When you see Lexington Bakes in that sea of like highlights and claims and shout outs and everything and sales and everything, 
it is the quietest, more subtle thing on shelf that just exudes confidence. And like the whole transparency of the brand is reflected in that transparent package. Like you never have to wonder what's in this is one of my like taglines. And because it's a clear package, people pick it up and they're like, no, yeah, I get it. I can see every angle of this product. I can see what's inside. I can see what's on top. I can see the ingredients on the back. I can see the brands of ingredients on the back. I literally have no questions about what's in this. What, um, you know, as we're, we're thinking through this and, you know, we, we tend to focus a little bit more on the e-commerce space. How does that change, you know, as we talk about shelf space and retail, um, when you have a little bit more space, you know, say you're on you know, your own website or even, you know, a third party uh, marketplace um, and there's some opportunity for people to kind of investigate a little bit deeper beyond, you know, the the package. How do you kind of think through, you know, I guess it's, you know, different customer personas and different, you know, buying intents, um, you know, kind of allowing those two spaces to coexist and and kind of have the the I know you know you kind of told the story of jumping into retail probably earlier than a lot of brands do because it it you know kind of found you it sounds like um but you know as you kind of build that up and have different amounts of your story and different amounts of of yeah really kind of the 360 degree brand view between those two different channels how do you think about that uh dtc is obviously extremely better at communicating more information but you still can't over communicate you you have to guide people through this journey of discovery through your product so it really just comes down to prioritizing what is going to convert someone is the radical ingredient transparency going to convert someone no is the ingredient sourcing policy no is it the the packaging design maybe is it the flavor yes absolutely it's absolutely the flavor so my primary goal on the website is to communicate epic luxury flavor um and then i just start thinking about well what are the obstacles to people saying yes the price uh the wait time the shelf life of the product when you get it um all of these things have been kind of applied to the design of the website. So like the packaging on shelf being very simple, no claims, the art direction of the website is again, very simple where, where most people would photograph the four pack box that you get online. My photos are still just the single unit brownie. When you hover, you get the rollover image of the four packs. You can understand it's not $40 for one brownie. It's $40 for four brownies. Um, but it's it's just these like. It's developing beautiful experiences that guide people through the journey of discovering what you're communicating. I feel like I just said those words and I'm not understanding them, but they sound great. Um, do you have any questions on what I just said? I think that's a, it's, it's to your point. I mean, it's, it's a kind of an amorphous idea and like, you know, to get specific of how you specifically do that is a challenge. And, and, you know, that is, that is brand design uh, in a nutshell. Right. But I think the, you know, just go and look at your website and you know really everything you said shines through it's transparent. It's, you know, I love just the, just like you talked about the clear, you know, transparent packaging um now you come to the website and you see you know most brownies that you're seeing on the site are not in packaging they're they're literally taking that even one step further and and you know showing off the product by itself you know with a lot of white yeah. space kind of you know just showing and zoomed in this is the product um i think that's it's interesting to think through you know, if you just glance at it, you say, oh yeah, it's, it's a product product shot. I've, I've seen that on, on other sites. It's, you know, like anything else, but when you start to get into like the specifics of it, you start to see that, that thread that went through from, you know, ingredient transparency and the provenance of each individual ingredient to the packaging, to, 
you know, the advertising and how it's showing up on your site. Um, and they kind of seem like arbitrary decisions. And then when you kind of take a step back and look at them like that, they all flow perfectly together. Um, you know, so almost more unconsciously than anything, um, the consumer kind of starts to recognize all of that as, you know, you as a brand. I, I often joke that I treat branding the way Taylor Swift te- uh, treats writing songwriting. And it's like, sure, a single song sounds great. But when you understand the full kind of album and then her full kind of discography, there's there's a string that goes through every tiny, every single word. Um, that's the level at which I design brands or kind of work on branding. Um, going back to our, our thoughts of big brands, can a big brand replicate this? And to some degree, big brands just want their logos everywhere. And on my website, the logo is in one spot. It's at the top of the, the homepage. Um, it's not on every single product. There's This goes back to a bigger conversation about branding where it, like, it's not just the logo, right? The art direction of the photography is part of the brand. Like the photos that you see on the website, if I add a new flavor and just post that on Instagram or on Pinterest or somewhere, I want you to know without seeing a logo or any text, that is a Lexington Bakes product just because of the photo direction, art direction. So it's it's simplifying so much that it's just easy to communicate to your consumer without them even knowing. Like most people will will see the photo and say, oh, that's Lexington Bakes and they won't know why. Like most people don't understand branding to that degree, but that's the best type of branding where it's not forced and it just clicks. Awesome. There's there's so much more to talk about the branding, but um, I don't want to, <laughs> I think we're, we might be at time. No, no, this is great. I and I, I think, yeah, leave a little bit of extra space here. I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll want to have this conversation again. Um, no, this has been been awesome, and and I, I love the the you know transparency of the brand and the ingredients. And again, kind of taking it full circle. Thank you for all of your transparency and you know how you're building this and 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 your story. Um, you know, I've been really enjoying this conversation, but long before this, following you, um, you know, Lex is is very uh, active on LinkedIn. Is where I get most of of uh, you know my content, but I'm sure you're in a lot of other places too. If uh, if I'm understanding you here. So, um, yeah, it's just been great. And I, I really appreciate, um, you know, you taking the time with us today, but just more generally, uh, you know, sharing so much of, uh, of what you do. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, LinkedIn is probably my most active social channel because I like to write. I can do that very quickly and efficiently and effectively. Um, when it comes to visual or video, I'm just like, I can't just shoot something and post it. I I need to plan it out. I need to film it. I need to edit it. I need to like, and by then it's like the moment's gone. Like Lex, just, (laughs) just post. So with LinkedIn, I feel like I can just write it and post it within like 20, 30 minutes. So thank, thank you for reading. I appreciate, appreciate that. Definitely. Um, Where else are you referenced? uh, LinkedIn. Um, Can you tell our audience kind of where else they can, can find you and, uh, and uh, these brownies? Of course. So Lexington Bakes brownies cookies are available at Foxtrot nationwide. They're in Chicago, Dallas, DC, Austin, and in LA. You can find us at every single Air One in the fridge. And in two weeks, you can find our new hazelnut John Duyev brownie. Exciting! I've learned a, a new uh, ingredient name today. <laughs> oh, so speaking of John Duyev, the reason it's part of the brownie name has to do with the amount of hazelnuts that is in the recipe. So John Duyev. In order to be called Janduya in Italy, you need a minimum, I think it's 30 or 40% hazelnuts. My brownie has more hazelnuts than chocolate. So Janduya is like 30% hazelnut to chocolate ratio. Mine exceeds that, so which is why it's a hazelnut Janduya brownie. It's the ratio of chocolate to hazelnut. That's awesome. Well, thank you again uh, so much for taking the time with us today. This has been awesome. Um, yeah, really excited to to launch this episode and let everybody hear a little bit more of your story. Um, Lindsay, would you read us out? Yeah, Lex, thank you so much for being our guest today. Just such a brilliant conversation, diving deep into branding. 
definitely too short. I would love to talk more about it. And uh, thank you to those watching and listening and tuning into Ecom Marketing with the Pitbulls. Please remember to subscribe to get all of our podcasts and YouTube videos as soon as they're released. And if you're finding this show valuable, we'd also really appreciate a like on YouTube or a review on your favorite podcast player. And we will see you all next time. Hey, it's Andy. I'm here with Percy, the original PPC Pitbull. Thanks for checking us out today. If you're ready to take the next step in your digital marketing journey, come on over to ppcpitbulls.com and book a free strategy session. We'll take a few minutes to get to know you and your brand, and I promise you'll leave with actionable insights that you can implement today. Working together, we're going to get you on the right track towards reaching your unique e-commerce goals.